Not the old geeks. Two old farts, a microphone, and the internet. What could go wrong? We are not in the same room anymore. This saddens me. <laughs> no, we're not. You are you are back where wherever you are, and it's probably cold. And the heat has just cranked up here. Uh, we're having crazy week here in L.A. Uh, fires and madness and, and insane heat, which has been wonderful, except for the fire <laughs> bit. Yeah, I, I walked uh, outside for about five minutes today, and I could not feel anything above the neck. It, <laughs> it really sucks. <laughs> and it's we're probably going to get snowed in today, so... Yay! Nice. Yay! Yeah. Well, it was fun having you out here, and we had a good time uh, having a few drinks after the show. A couple people came by. It was a good time. So, yes, eighty percent female. Eighty percent female. <laughs> uh, we'll definitely have to uh, sort out more more functions whenever we do get a chance to uh, be in the same place together. Obviously, I think the next time might have to be Chicago. I might have to book myself a flight out there. Yeah, because I've been schlepping my ass to your house for how many months now? <laughs> <laughs> True. So, yeah, definitely. Hop a flight. We'll go downtown and set up and have a good old time. Excellent. So, we've got some follow-up from last week. Yes, we do. I, I think I want to start with the app follow-up. Okay, let's do that. Because we, we, we talked about a bunch of apps last week, and uh, we also talked about uh, shark finning, yes, which is not <laughs> swimming across the pool with your hand on top of your head going doo 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 um, So, Jelly. Jelly was the first one, which was the big one from BizStone, the crowdfunding or crowdsourcing uh, your ignorance, I yeah. guess. Uh, pretty <laughs> much, yeah. Call it. Yeah, I, 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 got, uh, I got so over that app within basically – I shark finned on that so fast. Uh, within a day, I was just like, why the fuck do I have this installed? Yep, same here. No more than a day. It was just – People going. People didn't know what to do with it. No, it's, it's almost like Twitter at the beginning. Here's my cheese sandwich. You know. Yeah, there was most of the most of the questions that popped up were basically just jokes or kind of ridiculous, and the ones that were serious. Those are the things that you know. As we discussed last week, when when I was just even thinking about the app, I was like, well, why am I going to go through all the effort to do this and tell you, and I'm not getting paid or anything? Or, gee, ten seconds on Google would have gotten you the answer for that. Exactly. Every time you send a reply, it should be one of those let me Google that for you dot com replies. <laughs> yeah, there was quite a lot of those coming up. So, yeah, I, I kept the app on through uh, through this recording today. And uh, basically, as soon as it's done, I'm going to delete. Yeah, I already deleted it. I'm, I'm done with it. <laughs> uh, I, should, of, I should go back and kill my account somehow. That is exactly what I was going to ask about next, because I'll do my last time that I'm ever going to talk about Moves, which was the app that I loved for a long time for tracking my bike rides and steps. Uh, I'm getting rid of it. I'm finally done with it. Um, I spent about two hours attempting to figure out a way to get my data out of the program. Um, then I finally just gave up and said, nah, who cares? So I'm going to lose 150 days, uh, days of steps and, and biking information. I'm not you know, really tracking that or saving that information anyway, so I gave up on it. But it was a hell of a process to even attempt to try to do it. There aren't any good uh, plugins available to let you get it to it easily. They should just have something on their site that lets you dump raw data. They do not. And the question I was going to ask you, because I still haven't <coughs> deleted it yet, is am I being irresponsible if I just delete it, or do I have to actually, should I actually write them an email saying, please remove all of my data from your system? You should you should write them and have them remove it. Okay, that's exactly what I was going to ask because I know you go in and out of your apps all the time, and I I just had a feeling in the back of my head that I'm being completely stupid and irresponsible if I just delete the app. Yeah, um, anytime so I should do the same I, with the I, Jelly, right? I guess. Yeah, anytime I kill an app now, I, if if there was any type of account integration, yeah. like if it was a Twitter integration or a Facebook integration, first thing I'll do is go. Uh, well, first I'll look on their the app or the site because a lot of them now have you know yeah. delete my account and I can go through that and then I go to Facebook or Twitter and kill the API access right. so that so it's just gone. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I didn't do that with Jelly. I was just so pissed off at it. I just deleted it. So now I have to reinstall it, go back in, <laughs> kill everything, and delete it. Yeah. So that is a that is a step that everybody should start taking now when you add apps and delete them. Just uh, you know. I went through that process with some other app that didn't have a delete thing. I wrote them an email saying, please remove all my data. Three weeks later, they got back to me and said they did it. And, you know, just, you know, get rid of your stuff. Don't don't leave your breadcrumbs everywhere. Yeah, Path was the last one I got in a big fight with. They didn't want to delete my account and my data. I'm like, uh, delete my shit now. <laughs> they finally, finally acquiesced and got right. rid of my stuff. Right. Um, so Argus, you don't like Argus? I, no, I actually love Argus as an app. 
Uh, it's, it's way better than moves. I love it for tracking. I love like the fact that I can put in things like, you know, amount of coffee I'm drinking, uh, water consumption throughout the day, tea, all different kinds of activities are in there. Um, obviously if I had a Fitbit or any of the other things that they plug into, the app works great with all of those. It's, it's beautiful. I, I've really enjoyed using it the past week. The problem is it is an insane battery drain. I cannot be out for more. If I go out uh, like I did on Sunday uh, for three hours, uh, I was only out for three hours. The app was running, and my phone was dead ten steps away from my walk home. Uh, you need a five S. Yeah, I, just I, I you that's it's exactly what it is because battery drain for me was not an issue. Right. So um, yeah, I'm just on a five. Uh, obviously, the five S has better battery performance, anyways, and I'm sure. Well, no, it's got, the, that it's got the, the chip helps. It's the chip. Yeah. It's all about the chip. <laughs> so Argus on a five is is a little brutal. Um, luckily, I've got you know chargers, and and I'm usually not away from anything for more than three hours. But if I am, I have to turn the app off. Yeah, but it is a great I, app. I love it. it it's, it's it was pr- it's pretty. I deleted it just because I didn't use it. I right. I don't need it. Um, yeah. Well, you're a Fitbitter, so. Yeah, and I really don't care how much water I drink during the day. I know I drink enough water, and I don't care about how any of the other <laughs> metrics on there. It's like I wake up in the morning, I get on my my Fitbit Aria scale, it syncs that, and it tells me if I've been a good boy or a bad boy, and then I just walk, and it tells me if I've been a good boy or a bad boy. That's all I need. <laughs> um, I, I, I do want to do a shout out to Budify Two Electric Boodaloo. <laughs> um, yeah, we had a fun little Twitter chat with those guys. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know they were from Glasgow. That's awesome. Oh, yeah, me either, actually. Uh, you wouldn't. And, and what is it with Scottish uh, meditation people? My Andrew Johnson, he's Scottish too. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, uh, the voices in Budify too are, are very distinctly kind of English and even somewhat Londony. But uh, apparently, they are a bunch of Scottish guys. Uh, very funny. And I, I, I know they aren't going to send us that beer, but I would love it if they did. I thought it was whiskey that they said they were going to send us. Oh no, that's like one of the most insanely like uh, uh, rare beers there is. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's like seventy bucks a bottle or something. Jesus. So I've, I'm assuming that won't be coming our way. But uh, it was great talking to those guys. Um, very funny. Uh, one of the yeah, first, but one of the first times I enjoyed like being on Twitter for a couple seconds. <laughs> it was fun. But I wanted to say uh, regarding Budify too. I used it. I've been using it every single day. Yeah, and it, it's fantastic. Yeah. And I couldn't. I couldn't sleep the first night. Like after we talked about. Like after I'd gotten back to Chicago. I just couldn't sleep. I was wired and not feeling well. Right. Sorry, winded from running up the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I need to need to use my Fitbit app a little more. I guess the the, the L.A. flatland uh, killed my stair climbing ability. <laughs> but uh, anyway, in the morning when I'm getting out of bed, I'll listen to it too, just to kind of ease into the day. Right. Then in the middle of the day when I'm stressed, I'll pop on a little five minuter. So I've been loving this thing. It's totally relaxed me. Yeah, it's it's a great little app, and and you know I liked the I liked version one, but uh, version two has a ton more meditation, so it doesn't get quite as repetitive. I love it. Um, you know, I'll just uh, take a five to ten minute walk uh, in the middle of the day, usually after I get a really annoying email from a client, chills me out, come back relaxed, feeling good. Um, it's a great little app. It's perfect. Um, does exactly what you want it to do. Yeah, and I bought number. I bought one, and I never used it. Right. I, I mean, I used it like once or twice. I just didn't like the design, but this new design's fun. I give give them, give them a good thumbs up on that. Cool. Yeah. So apps, interesting. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll, I'll cover it when we get to the the other section. I've got a couple I'm trying out this week that will probably be in the follow up next week that we've already deleted. Excellent. <laughs> that uh, seems to be the way. Yeah, I have one more bit the, that is is somewhat follow up. It's actually a, a really interesting story uh, first. So so let's talk about the story and then I'll tell you why it's it's follow up. Um, I found this on Salon.com. Uh, it's People's Private Lives Are Private, or sorry, that's not the title, How Facebook Snooping Backfires on Employers. So apparently there, there is starting to be a backfire about, uh, about all this happening, about how you know basically any employer will look you up online, will check out your Facebook, check out your social networks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, people are starting to get pissed off about this, understandably so, because I do think that there is a separation between someone's private life and their ability to do a job. Absolutely. If your job is not public facing or in public relations, yeah. then it should not be an issue. Yes. Period. I mean, obviously, the what leaps to mind because you just said public relations was that idiot um, from the New York PR firm that did that whole uh, about to board a flight to South Africa. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if if your job is is being out there and that and being online and doing PR, then then it matters. Then you're a public face online. But if your job is you know Joe Schmo working in some office. 
who you know and you have pictures on your personal facebook page of you like getting bombed on the weekend big deal that doesn't matter well and it also the whole one of the points in the article that i thought was really interesting was mm-hmm. um Prospective employers are not allowed to ask you certain questions or allowed to discriminate on certain like uh, factors. Yeah. And by going and checking out your Facebook profile or your Twitter profile or like wheedling in through a friend to say, hey, can I check this guy out? I know your friends. Well, whatever. Yeah. They're they're breaking those rules and, and effectively breaking the law. Yeah, that's also so very true. It, yeah, more lawsuits are going to be coming out of this. And I knew it happened to me when I was uh, – Remember a long time ago we talked about that job where I had to do the live coding exercise? Right. And it was, that was just a, a terrible, terrible time. But those guys had also asked me for my Facebook, my Twitter, my LinkedIn, all my different social indicators. And like for Facebook, I'm like, well, the owner of the company already – we were friends on there. But I wasn't going to give out access to anybody else. Right. I'm like, I just drew the line. I'm like, my Facebook's private. Screw you. You can check me check me out. You, we've been friends for years on there. Yeah. The rest of the stuff, it just made me feel creepy. It like does, I'm, it, you know, it just I like it, it made me feel creepy about them. I'm like, why do you guys need to know this if you want me to type for a living? Yeah, I you think know? that is insanely creepy. I think the only social network that that any employee has any or any employer has any right to look at is LinkedIn because that's the point of that social network. Uh, the rest of them aren't, you know. I mean, Twitter is public, whatever. So. They're going to find what they're going to find, but uh, they shouldn't be able to ask you for any of that stuff or require it. Or obviously, you know, they'll discount you if you don't give it to them. Yeah. Yeah. So well, it's just, they need, people need to cut that shit out. Yeah, I agree. Period. I agree completely. LinkedIn is all you get access to because that's the whole point of it. But the main reason that this is in follow up is uh, the article, which is on Salon, is actually originally from Scientific American. And we had had a huge conversation and rant about appropriation on the internet. And how difficult it is, and and to see where things are from, um, yeah, uh, for the, the, the proper attribution argument. Yeah, the proper attribution article uh, argument, and they actually, I mean, Salon does a good enough job. We'll get into something a little bit later where they don't, um, because they have, you know, they have the logo. They have, they say this article was originally published by Scientific American, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what they didn't do, and this is really annoying to me, is all the links just go to Scientific American's homepage. They don't go to the actual article as it appeared on Scientific American, which is when you, when we're trying to do attribution and we're putting together our notes that will go on grumpyoldgeeks.com, I wasn't able to easily get the link that I wanted to put up there. I didn't want to put up the Salon one. I wanted the original one. Absolutely. That's it. That's what I've been trying to train you to do. So <laughs> good for you for trying, but yes. you still couldn't find it. No, I mean, you know, I can search for it, but. I'm, you know, we're we're doing this quick. We're doing this on the fly. We're not getting paid, so it's just like, all right, fine. I can't I can't give it to Scientific American now. I have to send the traffic to Salon. And here's another one, another Salon article where I was trying to follow your point to see how how bad they were. Yeah, they they linked her to a post uh, about we're living through the most peaceful era in human history, except for religious wars, basically, are on the rise. Yeah. Well, that was an article that was. Um, Alternate. Uh, from alternate yeah and if you they do link to the exact article in alternate but when you click on the link the alternate page has a sign up for our shit <laughs> box yeah which is you know uh, i want to just i want to find people that do that and just take them out of the internet and yeah do, that do bad that, things to them but the only way that you can read that article is if you know how to hit escape yeah and you know that escape is the way there's no close button there's nothing you have to you have to either put in your put in your goods or hit escape <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah. ridiculous. So uh, for for that one, Salon was okay, I think, with with it just because I read it there. And yeah, they they actually linked directly to the article. It's it's alternate that was annoying. So <laughs> yeah, well, they are <laughs> very annoying all the damn time. But <laughs> yeah. oh, so yeah, that's pretty much what I got for follow up this week. Um, I saw you finally got the the good microphone. We're we're, we're podcasting like uh, professionals now. That's we are, good. We are podcasting like professionals. You know, uh, we're basically just now stuck to the whims of of our mutual ISPs and Skype to make sure that we keep a clean connection. But uh, we're both using the wonderful Rode Podcaster mics with the boom setup. So. Yes, can, the, PS, the PSA one booms, I believe. Yes, so we can uh, type away, and I can you know drink my poor tea without uh, hearing the bangs and bleeps and all that sort of stuff going on while we're doing it. And and we, the nicest part about it is we don't have to futz around with like levels and anything anymore. We just you know we're both on the same mic, we plug it in at the same category, and we're good to go. And you're getting another call. Comment of the week. 
Our comment of the week comes from Jake Stefanich. Uh, he's got a website at sparkbmxtraining.com. He says, hey, guys, just found about about <laughs> It's always hard to read once you're used to bullshitting, isn't it? I know. It really is. Uh, <laughs> hey, guys, just found out about the podcast from my friend Calby Mundy, who, by the way, is the co-host of the Does It Have Legs podcast, also on the Grumpy Old Geeks podcasting network. Right. Um, I'm a BMX coach, trainer, personal trainer, and aspiring internet mogul. Okay, I'm well, about- there's problem number one. He's got he's, well, yeah. He's got like eight job titles there, <laughs> and nobody should ever be an aspiring internet mogul. Yeah, that's that's the one I was pointing out specifically. <laughs> yeah, don't ever say that to anybody ever again. Um, entrepreneur. Um, I'm about to start my own podcast, focusing on BMX racing content with some training tips mixed in. I actually just bought BMXpodcast.com today. By the way, great domain. Yeah, that you nailed it with that. That was a very Dude. good move on your part. Great domain. Mm -hmm. Um, You guys seem to have your shit together. (laughs) (laughs) Seem. Uh, Just wondering if you have any tips, ideas for a brand new podcaster. I hope to hear back from you. I subscribe to Grumpy Old Geeks Podcast and can't wait to listen to more episodes while I work. Sweet. Excellent, Jake. Thanks for the email. Uh, My first comment is is that coming to us... uh, to get tips is a bit like going down, uh, walking down your street and stopping to talk to the lovely 10-year-old neighbor girl that sells lemonade about business when you should be talking to Donald Trump. But, you know, thanks for the vote of confidence. Well, here, here's the deal. <laughs> yes, we don't make any money on this because we don't really try that hard. Um, he's, got a, he's got a business already. Yeah. So he's doing an awareness podcast, which I think is a great thing. And uh, – Especially with BMX coming is going to be a sport in the upcoming Olympics. Yeah, you know now is the perfect time, and he's already training pros and all that. I checked out his website, which does need a a facelift, by the way, um, <laughs> big time. Uh, I think I think starting a podcast right now is great, especially because he's got a niche. Yeah, he's yeah. got he's got people that he already knows in the industry, so yep. it's perfect. So I, I don't want to you know uh, get on him about starting a podcast now. The the things that we've learned are uh, <laughs> well yeah let's 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 go with yeah. this because uh, we're coming up almost on uh, almost a year of of doing this now so mm-hmm. we have, we have learned a couple things uh, first off I agree with everything that Jason just said um, you're niching yourself perfectly you're already in the industry um, you're gonna have no problem I mean obviously it's it's a niche so don't expect to have you know uh, mass appeal. But you're already in there. You're networking with people. Just start telling everybody you know about your podcast once it's up. Uh, I'm Obviously, you're probably involved with all the online forums that are involved with BMX, et cetera, et cetera. So you've got to you know, get active in those. Always mention your podcast. Draw from people in those things. Have them be guests on your podcast, and that's how word will spread about it. Um, you should have no problem getting an avid group of followers that are way into BMX. So that part, no problem. The part that you'll probably have to work on is I'd imagine you've never done one before or, you know, haven't, you know, gone around doing talks about BMX, uh, being in the public, speaking about it, bullshitting, bullshitting, bullshitting. And you're probably not an audio engineer or anything like that. So that's the learning curve that you're going to have to come up on. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. The the actual technicals of doing the podcast are, you know, what, what kind of got us in the beginning. We didn't know. Well, yeah, speaking on camera or on mic. <laughs> Again, see, yeah, uh, we're, we're we're professionals. Um, well, we, speaking we, on you mic know, took us months it, to it, even get our first episode out. Yeah, so for, schedule yourself a lot of time to do a bunch of test episodes. I, you know, Jason and I. This this was born in sitting around at a bar, getting drunk and talking about tech, and we went, "Wow, we're actually pretty interesting." Now, th- there's a huge leap from sitting in a bar bullshitting about tech to sitting in front of two microphones and making an hour to an hour and a half podcast about tech. Yeah, we were pretty interesting. We, we got more interesting as the beers commenced, as the <laughs> night went on, and we finally figured out, oh, shit, we got to do this sober. Yeah, <laughs> and, because and we weren't got, nearly as interesting. They got very unintelligible, and uh, there was a lot of super inside information and, and, and <laughs> very bad things <laughs> said that we could – we were like, we cannot put this out there. No. Nope. Um, so there's that. So, so give yourself a few tests. Um, Test shows. Uh, well, get- yeah, that's I wanted, let me let me uh, talk a bit, a bit about that because we did four episodes when we first started. We're like, I oh, will nail this the first time, no problem. <laughs> and when I said coming into it, I'm like, everybody I know, they've got this four episode mark where they throw away the first four, and the first episode you hear is their fifth one. Right. And I and I we, I thought it was bullshit, but you know what? That was our first episode. Was number five. That's so exactly what happened. Yeah. It really is like 
and do a full show, uh, edit it, you know, write it, record it, edit it, get it done, put it on your phone, listen to it. Yep. And, you know, you'll you'll see where you screw up. It's really <laughs> not that hard. And give it to a friend. We had we had some really good people that uh, gave us a, a lot of good tips in the beginning. Mm hmm. So there's a lot of practice involved. From the audio side, it's a lot easier now. Like if you're just using GarageBand, uh, there's some couple there's a couple quick easy tools. I use Sound Studio to do my editing uh, for uh, Does It Have Legs because I'm I'm the editor on that. Brian's the editor on this one. He's got crazy high end tools that he uses. <laughs> yeah. um, get a copy of Levelator, which is a free app that will will save you tons of time at the end and give you like a more rounded professional sounding podcast. You just drag your file onto it, then De- convert definitely. it to MP3 and off to the races. Get a good podcasting host. There are two that I know of that there's a uh, blueberry and um, Libsyn. We use Libsyn because we want good stats. We didn't do that from the beginning. So our first 15 episodes, we've got no stats on. Right. And, that's that's really key because in, as the as your podcast grows, you're going to want to bring people in to be sponsors. And without those stats, without like professional stats that that are audited by somebody else, you're not going to get the money from the sponsors because you're not going to have the right, you know, that set up from the get go. Yeah. And it's just easier to have somebody else deal with that stuff. Um, Agreed. I think if there's anything else. Uh, you know, just uh, like I, uh, we just switched to the Rode Podcaster mics. I mean, that's a one-stop shop. I, you can't, uh, you can't beat it. We'll have the link in in the show notes. Um, you know, it's a little bit pricey, but you get the mic and the boom and everything, and and you're basically completely sorted for audio quality. And uh, yeah, I know. tell you what, it's cheaper than what I did, which is buy like keep buying cheaper mic, like my <laughs> cheap mics, and buy a little more expensive, a little more expensive. If I'd have just from the get go went out and bought two Rode Podcasters with the booms. And the shock mount, I would have probably saved 500 bucks. Yeah, this is where we ended up. We went through a bunch of mics first. These work perfectly. Uh, get yourself a nice, comfortable pair of headphones. I recommend the Sennheiser HD 280 Pros. They're great because uh, you're going to spend a lot of time wearing them. <laughs> and, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and just kind of get into a groove and figure out how, you know. The other main thing was that, that took us a while to get there, too, was to kind of find a structure. So you might want to sit, and that'll come out of the first four episodes that you do that you think are going to be great but won't be, and you'll never put out. Uh, you'll kind of fall into to a bit of a structure, figure out if you want to have segments, um, all that sort of stuff, and figure out right away if you plan on having a lot of guests because that throws another interesting thing into the loop, both technically and in terms of conversation so yeah yeah and in time time involved because when we have guests on it we spend a lot more time doing research and making sure things are just right and uh well sometimes i guess we had, <laughs> I, I guess the joey robbie episode we didn't really spend that much time on no we spent um, a lot of time drinking for that yeah one, so. yeah <laughs> uh but just just factor in like a podcast is a a, a time commitment you yeah. know it's yeah. a serious time commitment I think, like I was saying before, does it have legs? I edit that thing. I do all the recording, editing, website, social, that whole thing. I'm looking at 12 hours a week to do that show. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it's and if you're doing it by yourself, expect to spend some time on it at the beginning or find find some cheap interns that you can hire to do the editing for you, the posting stuff. I mean, it's not hard stuff, but you're definitely – there's a learning curve. It took us almost a year here to get where we're at, and we ain't even that far. <laughs> <laughs> nope, that's very true. So, you know, it's, it's, it's just a it's – a, you're going to go through a period of trial and error where you're going to figure out what works, what doesn't. You'll find a groove about editing um, and putting things together and getting it out there. And the main thing is, you know, you got, you got to put in the time to make it compelling and interesting. And uh, that's that's another. Oh, that's what we haven't done. Shit. Yeah, that's that's where we consistently fail. Um, <laughs> but you got to factor in that the, that time as well. So it's not just recording the podcast, editing it, uh, getting it out there. You know, not you know doing beds and if you want to do that sort of stuff for different uh, intros and outros for segments. But you know, we also put in time. We find stories. We find interesting stories. We put them out there. We talk about them a little bit before we go on and talk about things. Um, your content is obviously king. So the two main things you want to focus on is your content and make sure it sounds good because no one will listen to a podcast that sounds like shit. And we've had many of them and somehow people have struggled through them. But <laughs> We've lost a lot of people based on our audio quality. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean now, now we're dialed in and we got it, so we're passing that knowledge on to you. But there's always going to be things you can't control like you know the, the episode where I was doing it from London and had shit internet. You know, There's just only so much you can do. Yep. 
All right. Well, good luck. And uh, let us know when your podcast's up so we can uh, give it a listen and uh, pimp it on the show. In the news. So there was a, uh, an article I found this week called The NASA Studies on Napping in Priceonomics.com. Uh, it's an old study that was done by NASA on uh, long-haul jet pilots and their reaction time and uh, how, how it works to nap and does it help, kind of. <laughs> I mean it's, it's basically a study on napping and it's been quoted over and over again. It was brought up this week because um, there's a guy who is doing a Kickstarter campaign who's going around making the circuits doing the napping stories. I just thought it was a fantastic article because it kind of broke down the old NASA study. Sorry, I was taking a little nap. and I was going to say, where are you? I, I <laughs> woke up to there. a nightmare of there being some sort of Kickstarter about napping. I know, it's a Kickstarter about <laughs> um, napping. So so take take the article with a grain of salt. Yeah, this is uh, a promoted yeah. article to a certain extent. Um, you know, I, I'm not personally a napper. I definitely know of people that need them. Um, I think everybody's different, but uh, okay. <laughs> I Well, I am a napper. I love napping. Now that I don't have to go to an office. Yeah. Uh, like two, three in the afternoon, I hit my Paziz Energizer app on my phone, lay down for 20 minutes, turn off, like close the blinds. Oh, my God. Wake up. Feel like a new man. Right. I think napping is good for everybody. Uh, so, the, so the study says. You just have too much poo air. To, <laughs> you can't fall asleep. I probably do crank myself up with a little too much caffeine throughout the day. but uh, I was really – by the way, I was really fucking pissed off that I got to your place and you were out of tea. <laughs> I got to say that. I really wanted to try that tea. And uh, now you're drinking it again and I'm I'm gone. I know. That was two days after you left that the box of poor tea showed up. So sorry about that. Um, actually, David, davidtea.com. We'll give them a little plug. Uh, they've got some of the best selection I've seen. They ship it right to your door. Very nice stuff. Throw it in the show notes because I want to get some. Will do. Oh, so the Napwell is the, the world's first napping mask, which I call bullshit on because – uh, you There's had plenty sleep of masks, masks forever. Yeah, yeah. they this sell them. They sell them at every airport kiosk. Yeah, uh, he met his goal though. So unfortunately, it will be thrust upon the world six months behind schedule, as always, as per Kickstarter. <laughs> so yeah, okay. Well, napping, napping, napping. Uh, the other thing that hit the news, uh, you know, Nest was bought out by Google. I think. Did we talk about that at all last week? I it, it happened after. It, it happened, happened after. after. So yeah. Google purchased Nest, which led to a bunch of jokes and and some not entirely unwarranted concerns about Google now being able to access how long you're in your house, what particular room you happen to be sitting in at any particular time. A whole lot of metrics they could grab if they. I don't think to. Nest. I don't think <laughs> Nest is sitting there like like Sauron with his eye telling you which room you're in. <laughs> no, but uh, which but, was a pretty funny graphic going around. It was. It was a great. <laughs> Graphic. And there were a lot of jokes about it. Um, I've been a fan of Nest since day one. I, I really like the idea of the company kind of taking over these things that we never think about in our house and updating them to the 21st century. Um, so I read an article about the smoke detector specifically because that one had freaked me out a little bit because it is ridiculously expensive compared to the price of a regular smoke detector. Uh, they, they're coming in at, I think, 120 bucks each, and you figure most homes need at least three to four. As opposed yeah, to, least. you know, you can buy a pack of, of four, you know, standard smoke detectors for like 30 or 40 bucks at Home Depot. So it's a significant increase in price to, to take yourself up to Nest level. Um, far higher than, than their original product, which is the, you know, the home AC units, which are only a little bit more pricey than your standard units. Um, anyways, it's, it's basically the uh, nice little review of it. it. says it's absolutely great if you want to spend the money. <laughs> so, well, yeah, I mean, everything's great. If I, I a Ferrari's yeah. great. If I want to spend the money, exactly. Um, so, I, I mean, uh, maybe the the hope, I guess, is with Google behind them, they'll be able to drop prices. They'll take over leadership in in this market. Which, as far as I know, they're really the only people out there. I don't know too many other companies that are starting to do high end home equipment. So, here's what I want with the Nest stuff. Mm -hmm. I think it's beautiful. Yeah, I, I love the thermostat. I think it's fantastic. Oh yeah, it's amazing. Take the goddamn Wi-Fi chip out of it. I'd buy one in a heartbeat. <laughs> I do not want anything in a home Wi-Fi connected to the rest of the world, you know, especially a smoke detector. Because you know what? Hack the smoke detector, turn it off, set the house on fire, burn everybody in their sleep. Okay, done. Go Let's write see. the novel. 
So Here's your story. Now, I was concerned just about Google getting access to that stuff. You've got people hacking in. Uh, I, I kind of agree with you. I do like – I love the app aspect of it, being able to control everything from the app, and I don't know how you do that without Wi-Fi. Um, you know, so – You don't. Everything goes through the network. What if you're not home? What if I want to turn on my AC when I'm still you know, finishing up that, a meeting? That's why it goes through the network. Right. You, you, you have to probably pop into Nest servers that are tied into your Wi-Fi router at home. Probably VPN through, hopefully, or some kind of secure connection, hopefully, and then it talks to your thermostat, and boom, you're done. Um, but we we've, we've lived without this technology for like oh the entirety of humanity, so we've done okay with figuring out how to turn the goddamn AC on. I'm just saying. <laughs> we've also lived without cars for the majority of humanity, but uh, you know, progress, man. I love this stuff. I, I've if I'm in the position of being able to design a you know home in the future, or you know if I don't own my place in LA, the problem is I rent here. But like my place in Toronto, I would totally put this stuff in. I love it. And so this is the funny part. I'm the homeless guy bitching about home automation and the security <laughs> involved. Yeah, this is like like uh, I went to a conference in Washington D.C. where Cory Doctorow, who is a Canadian, is railing on the head of the FCC about. The rights of Americans. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I, I'm the Cory Doctorow of home automation, I guess. Yeah. And just, I'm, I want to save you from yourselves. That's all. That's all. <laughs> uh, hey, I, I, the, the stories about people breaking in when, uh, breaking into people's homes when they post that we're going on vacation on Facebook. You know, I was, I was doing that two years before it ever hit the news. That's true. And so I'm just saying. Every time. So, yeah, I mean, there, were, there will always be cases of that happening, I assume. But I do, I like Nest. I like where they're going. Uh, I don't have a lot of faith, faith in, in Google taking it the direction that you want it to go, which is more private and more secure. But you never know. Maybe they'll get somebody over there that goes, hey, we have the ability to do this. And we've got the money in the back and behind us now. So let's make something even cooler. Yeah, and I, and I would like to point out that my father sold security systems for a living for like 15 years, so right. I, come, I come from a, a uh, background of security paranoia. Exactly. You certainly do. <laughs> so speaking of Facebook, they're apparently doing something again that I don't care about. But you linked to the topic, so bring it up. Well, you know, it's uh, trending. <laughs> what are they doing? Trending topics is now rolling out on Facebook because they are attempting to kind of – I guess the theory is they're trying to present themselves as a as a place for breaking news and, and current events and all that sort of stuff as well. You know, trying to get a little bit of that Twitter mind share. So, That's so stupid. Why do these people just need to leave each other alone and focus on what they're good at? I, I believe that was a rant of mine from about oh ten episodes ago. They're all mm-hmm. beca- they're all becoming the exact same thing. <laughs> they are. Yeah. Twitter is adding things that make it more like Facebook. Facebook is adding things that make it more like Twitter. Snapchat is going to be a laughing stock in history when we look back at it because they're dumb. <laughs> Oh yeah, they're 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 going to be the great. They are the new pets. dot com. Oh yeah, totally. I, and it's funny because everybody always mentions Snapchat. Like all these article, all these tech articles about Facebook and Twitter when they add these things and the battle going on between them always end with some stupid comment from lazy journalists like, "Well, five years from now when we're all on Snapchat, I guess we'll look back at this and laugh." I'm like, no, no, no. There will not no, there will not be a Snapchat in five years, and we'll be laughing at that one. Well, it, there may be, but Justin Timberlake will own it, and it'll be part of my space. <laughs> yeah. And he, he'll probably buy it for 45 bucks. Exactly. So yeah. there's that. So look forward to that. I guess they're rolling it out this week. I suppose this will come out on Monday. By then, you'll probably see it on your upper right-hand side. I don't know. It said it was going to be in by Thursday, and I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet either, which is weird because historically, I've always gotten the, the Facebook stuff pretty quick when it rolls out, and I'm not seeing it yet. So maybe they're having a bit of a hitch. Who knows? But you'll or, be seeing uh, – Or like half of my, my sidebar on Facebook is gone because I have an ad blocker on. So maybe it fits the dimensions of an ad, and it's already there, but we just can't see it. It could be, and eventually, obviously, that's that's another one of Facebook's plays. There is the trending topics will be sponsored, so as per usual. But Twitter's already are too. So again, same same. <laughs> so You've got something. okay, this I, I, this is a story I hadn't heard yet. Hershey and 3D Systems join forces to create printable confections. Yeah, this this popped up on Engadget, and it's one of those uh, one of those rare times where the grumpy old geeks get all giddy and go, "Isn't technology awesome?" <laughs> this is, yeah, this is like the NASA pizza printer that they're working on. Exactly. It's it's very similar. So this was announced, uh, obviously, at CES where everybody announces all kinds of bullshit that will never show up. Uh, hopefully this one will. Hershey and 3D Systems have joined forces uh, basically to create a, a, a thing that will allow you to print confections. So everybody can be your own Willy Wonka. 
Great, except I don't eat sugar. <laughs> Well, that sucks for you. Uh, it does. <laughs> it's a yet-to-be-released machine will fall under the Chef Jet line and also support printing 3D objects with sugar. So it's going to be pretty awesome. It ain't going to be cheap. You're never. You're not going to have this at your home anytime soon. But uh, it'll be really cool to see what uh, what people do with it. And I'm sure it'll end up being like a reality show on Bravo or something. Yeah, give it four you know, years. Shot- give it four years. You'll be in the home. Look at the MakerBot. You know, so many people have those already. If you can print with plastic, you can print with sugar. Exactly. Probably at a, at, a, at a higher resolution too. Well, one would imagine so it's going to be pretty cool uh, i'm i'm you know this is when i get excited about science and tech so here's a, here's an article that i just found this morning that i didn't even read but it had a great cover picture <laughs> <laughs> kind of reminded me of uh going to club perversion back in the 90s it, it, it's uh, very similar to, to some of the girls that we used to dance with there yes yeah yeah <laughs> you didn't you didn't need a bra you just needed electrical tape on your nipples that's all so. you have to do yeah and I don't know what booth this is from, but here's here's the headline: scientific evidence that booth babes don't sell products. Uh, I'm going to file this one under. I don't care. Uh, and well, I really don't. My point being that I don't think anybody ever thought they did. The whole point was it was a bunch of dudes stuck in a conference hiring hot chicks to stand around. Yeah, you've got an expense. You know, you've got an expense account. Use it. That's yeah. what they used it for. So, okay. <laughs> I know there's this whole like, trying to integrate the sexes and technology shit going on, and I'm probably going to be labeled a pariah and nailed to a cross for it. But I don't care. I like booth babes. I went to CES – or not CES. Uh, what was it? Um, uh, EG – not EG. What's the damn video game conference in LA after they banned them? I don't know. I don't play video games. You're asking the wrong oh, person. <laughs> sorry. Um, E3. I went to E3 after they banned him, and it was just boring. It was a bunch of it was a sausage fest. Right. Well, I, I I have no problem with booth babes. I mean, this is old school advertising. It's all a bit ridiculous. I'm I'm sure that there's some company that's going to come out with with booth beefcake, and you know, so they'll be hug, hunky. I mean, that's Abercrombie and Fitch, isn't it? Every time I go into that store, there's a bunch of dudes standing around without their shirt on. Yeah, and nobody has an outcry about that. Speaking of which, I didn't get this in the in the show notes, but this was a story that hit the lines yesterday, which is just absolutely ridiculous. Did you hear what American Apparel is doing now to get uh, some publicity? <laughs> I dude, I could I could probably talk. For, I could have a twenty minute stand up routine on what American Apparel is going to be doing now to get. Go ahead, tell me what it is. <laughs> they have added pubic hair to their mannequins, and not subtle. I mean, we're talking full on nineteen seventies. Never seen a razor pubic hair. Okay, I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> so they put tidy whities on the mannequins, on the female mannequins, and basically hair is exploding out the sides. And, you know, it was just, it, it hit the news everywhere. It's such a stupid publicity stunt. It's ridiculous. And, of course, they had to come out with some sort of statement about, we're concerned about female gender body issues, and we're asking people to question what it means. No, bullshit. You wanted to get in the news. Fuck you. Um <laughs> Do you, do you have the press release in front of you? No, I don't. Sorry. Oh, because I bet Ryan Holiday's name is on it. He's the guy that does all the stuff for American Apparel. He wrote Trust Me, I'm Lying. He's a master manipulator. He worked with Tucker Max. I mean, this is the uh, guy right, who right. is the the genius of doing stupid shit to get press. And if this just reeks of, <laughs> of one of his ideas. Yep. So. Well, so that's going on. So let's talk about something serious. After we've gone from models or, you know, pubic hair. So, basically, we have lost net neutrality. The court struck it down. It is gone. For good. That's, well, I don't know. There's still appeals in progress, but, yeah, it it's pretty much seems like the battle is lost. It does seem that way. And this is something that I was talking about, uh, you know, we were talking about just, uh, just the last podcast, basically. Um, this opens up. Uh, the internet, as we know it, is is now gone. Uh, ISPs control everything. They they will control what you see and what you can get. Um, they will control how fast you get it. And uh, companies are going to start paying to be able to deliver you content. It, it's it's all over. This is game over. It's it's pretty bad. I mean, if you go back and listen to the last episode, what we were talking about. Um, I think I need to Kickstarter that that router that has the different internet connections and yeah. check checks your Netflix usage versus your whatever and and routes packets accordingly because it's going to get bad. Yeah, it's going to get real bad, and and uh, I'm actually heartened to see how many people seem to be kind of paying attention or at least reading the idiot's guide to it on like Huffington Post or things like that. I saw quite a few people who I know aren't really technically motivated or or pay attention to anything posting the link on their Facebook. So hopefully. 
people are paying attention. People will do something about this, although they're, you know. What the hell are they going to do? What, what the hell are any of us going to do? This is completely out of our hands. This is big business. This is government. And they are pretty much fucking the entire internet. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yay. It's not. It's not good. But, but, but like the NSA already hasn't fucked our technology business in the U.S. at this point. Now we just got to go stick our dick up our own ass at this point. I mean, <laughs> that's it. It's just we're fucking ourselves. Yeah, I mean, this is something that that we literally could probably talk about for a two hour podcast. But why we we why there are, there are other podcasts <laughs> out there with people that are smarter than we are and generally yeah. do yeah. a better job of it we just piss, piss and moan about we just it piss and, and piss and moan about it i mean frankly it, it's out of the hands of regular people or technologists now anyways it's in the realms of of corporate lawyers this is where everything is now lawyers and lobbyists exactly so probably yeah here's here's where we, here's where we're going to see the war we're going to see Google versus I, Google, Netflix, content creators versus ISPs. the people. The people who own just the wires in the damn ground—that's what they own. They shouldn't be able to, you know, say what can go over. It's, oh, geez, makes make my fucking head explode. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean it, it, that's that's what it is going to be. It's going to be content creators and and tech companies versus ISPs. And oh, you know what we're going to go back to? I know I figured it out. We're going back to CDs through the mail. <laughs> net, net, we're going back to Netflix DVDs on demand. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, that's going to be the way around it. Is is we're going I'm going to fill out a postcard to Google. I'm going to say, Google, can you tell me about uh, <laughs> mesothelioma, please? And I'll mail the postcard, and then I will get a DVD back a week later. It will it will revitalize the post office. It will be undisrupted. I know we're gonna. We're, this might cause us to unfuck and undisrupt. Which might be nice. And, and it's also getting us away from the cloud stuff that I've been screaming about for years. The only difference between this and, and my worry about the cloud is, you know, now it's going to be metered and sponsored. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. I'm glad I didn't sign up for any online backups. I just went and bought a new hard drive. Yeah, <laughs> I, I would definitely never do that, especially not at this point. I mean, your, your uplinks are going to be throttled, especially for that kind of stuff. They're not going to They work. already are. You only get 250 gig a month yeah. on like on general Comcast plans or Time Warner plans or any of the big the big box boys, mm-hmm. you know. And it goes back to I used to have a T1 in my bedroom. And I kind of want to go back to that and just have my own straight to the straight to the provider. Yeah, you know? yeah. But I mean, you get into the problem. I mean, I was thinking about about this net neutrality stuff as soon as the as the ruling came out as well, and I was like, well, boy, that certainly opens up a market for you know some uh, some crazy like maybe kickstarted ISP that's going to be all all your data is nothing's metered. We it's all free, but. They don't own. Think, they don't own the lines. They're going to have to. I leave, got it. You know I what? Got it. Unless nope, I know, unless they're going to do it. Hmm. I know who's going to do it. Richard Branson, Virgin Internet. <laughs> yeah, well, unless he comes in and actually builds out all the physical lines, uh, he's going to have to rent them from other people. He's going to have to rent them from AT and T and Verizon, who've put who've put all that infrastructure in already. Yeah, but once he rents them, then it's he. I mean, then he controls what goes over the pipe. They right. can't they can't throttle something that you have time on. Right. I, I'm I'm hoping, um, but there's still like. Thousands and thousands of miles of dark fiber out there that was put down in the the late nineties that has never been lit up. Yeah, it's you know just ripe for somebody to come in and buy up. That's true. So hopefully somebody will. I mean, I'm surprised Google isn't making a play themselves to get around everything. Just own own the own the lines themselves. They can't. There's no way. Right. Anti antitrust would knock them knock their dick in the dirt, as they say, <laughs> big time. There, there's no way Google could do that. And just to just to illustrate how dire the situation is, I, I'd like to point out the fact that I actually just appealed to our overlords Google to save us. Yeah, that's pretty bad. <laughs> that's pretty bad when you're looking to Google to save your ass. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's depressing. Let's let's kill the news. So this week on Kickstarter in the Balls, we don't actually have anything on Kickstarter, but we have a new Kickstarter-ish startup. Yeah. Called Travolta. As in John? Uh, kind of, I guess. He likes to travel. He's a pilot. He owns his own planes. Uh, <laughs> no, this is a – this is crowdfunded travels. Uh-huh. I don't know what the name has to do with that, but yeah. yes – this is you go put up your dream trip and you get people to give you money so you can go on vacation. Do I even need to rant about this anymore? <laughs> Please. 
I think you should. This one's pretty funny. Come on. This is fucking infuriating. It's insulting. Why the what the who the what? No, oh, I don't. I don't even have words. This is a fucking go away. Fuck you. Come on, Brian. Use your words. <laughs> fuck. Fuck everybody that signed up on this and put one up. Fuck all of you. Pay for your own fucking vacation. <laughs> Assholes. So, friend of the show, Jonas Luster has one up <laughs> that we will uh, we will link to in the show notes. Uh, let's see if he's got any any takers yet. Nope. <laughs> Been up for shocking. Some, nobody nobody wants to pay for your vacation. Yeah, that's kind of that's that's the problem with this one. It's like. You want people to pay so you can go have a good time. Look, you, you know what this company would work for? They they should make a deal with like a wedding dot com and this you know part of a gift registry. You set up your honeymoon. Um, people instead of buying you a fucking set of plates in China can donate as part you know part of your Hawaii trip. For that, fine. Totally. That's a good idea. You I, should actually do that one. I know. Well, that's you Kickstarter that. Maybe we should Kickstarter one. Yeah. So we can call it uh, GayTravolta.com. dot <laughs> com. Uh, cater to the rare. <laughs> like, uh, sorry, I had to put that in. Couldn't help. Um, yeah, this is uh, this just annoys me to to no end. And the, it sh- you know, I, I've actually been thinking more and more about this. And and Lefsitz letter talked a little bit about it. And I, I actually feel that finally crowdsourcing is starting to shark fin. I think we're starting to see a backlash to it. Um, I don't. Obviously, this the stuff is up and. This is just ridiculous to everybody. Everybody can see how ridiculous this is. Um, so I, I think it's starting to go away. I mean, I think people are, are fed up with it. People are starting to have bad experiences, as, as we've talked about ad nauseum, uh, products being six months late, a year late, uh, never really showing up. Um, you know, bad, bad incentives. Our Chug t-shirts were horrible. The Chug show still hasn't shown up. Uh, people not being able to make the products that they said they were going to make. People skipping out on, on important issues and important legislations that exist and rules and reasons why Soma Water isn't what it says it is. And all the other problems that we see with all the crowdsource stuff. Um, you know, and Lessis even talked like about Amanda Palmer and how, oh, it's going to change the music industry. Well, Amanda Palmer's doing a new album and it's shockingly, she's not using Kickstarter this time. Nobody oh. is. I mean, nobody, uh, it's, I think it's shark finned. I think people have started to see through it. I think it's going to go back to what it's really good for, which is, you know, your Etsy small hobby project stuff that a small group of people fund. And that's all it should ever be for. And it certainly shouldn't be for your fucking vacation. The only thing I think about this site is like, wow, if, if you actually find people dumb enough to give you money to go on vacation, good on you. Yeah. <laughs> go, go for it, man. By all Seriously. means. Yeah. I mean, why not put one up and see? <laughs> I will say I have had one good Kickstarter experience, and those are my werewolf cards. Right. They, yeah. they came out perfect. They were late. But the that's, guy's, that's the guy's a, dog died. It's okay. But that's exactly oh. the type of project that I think it should be for, and I think it'll eventually – that's all crowdsourcing and crowdfunding will be. A small, you know, independent, little artsy hobby type project. Oh, Speaking of, I got to put this in the show notes. Mm-hmm. There's a guy that's making a set of Edgar Allan Poe playing cards on Kickstarter that look awesome. Again, ex- <laughs> so, exactly yeah. what, what exactly what crowdsourcing and crowdfunding should be for. Yep, yeah. independent artists trying to make a product that they can't fund on their own. Yes, not not plan an extraordinary trip and get it funded by inspired people, amazed friends, and generous sponsors. I'm so inspired by looking at other people's vacations, I'm going to give them money instead of taking my own. Yeah, really. <laughs> what, the, what the fuck? <laughs> I mean, I, apparently these people never saw the study that, like, looking at other people's travel photos just makes you depressed. It and bums hateful. you out. Yes. It bums you out and makes you not <laughs> like your friends anymore. So if these people are going to pay me to go on vacation, I think they're probably going to have a hitman waiting for me in the hotel room <laughs> just so they can get their satisfaction. <laughs> yeah. Ah, this I is agree. one of the most ridiculous things I've ever seen. And yeah, I'm really, you know, I'm hoping that's shark fin on crowdsourcing, crowdfunding is, is. I don't think you can, I don't, I think this is not part of the quote-unquote shark fin model because that's a rapid adoption, immediate drop-off. This has been growing forever. This is a standard bell curve distribution of of users. Yeah. I just I just hope we're at the tail end yeah, me too. of the whole thing. Let's let's yeah. get it back to Etsy type arts and crafts and, and super cool like one person just doing something amazingly artistic that you know he would never get funded any other way. He or she would never get funded any other way. Let's let's get it back to that. Let's not make it major Hollywood movies. Let's not make it million dollar video games. Million dollar video games. Let's not make it things that you can fund through normal avenues that we already ha- have an existing business for. And let's certainly not make it for people's vacations. 
Now, Brian, we didn't have cars in the past. <laughs> so, are you saying you 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 are poo pooing on the progress of the the human species? I I don't see Kickstarter. I don't see crowdfunding as progress. Okay. I, I just don't. And and like you said, it, it's we're all discovering. It's rare and it's few and far between that we find one of these projects that actually delivers as said. Absolutely. So, enough of that. Okay. Good luck, Jonas. <laughs> I hope you enjoy your trip. Sorry, man. Yo, seriously? Are you shitting me? Last night, I was uh, sitting around after a quick little dinner with some friends and maybe a beer or two. And I'd had a total are you shitting me moment uh, when a story popped up on my Facebook feed. So, LAist, which I believe you are very familiar with, Jason... They were my, my fierce competitors when I ran blogging.la, yes. Yes. And uh, yes, go ahead. I, I won't say any more. <laughs> well, they're, they're doing rather well for themselves. And, and they're definitely, uh, you know, they have a good presence here in LA. A lot of people check them out all the time. They're de- definitely all over Facebook and social networks. Um, they have made some attempt at, uh, or definitely a leap at trying to be actual real journalism instead of just a blogging platform. Unfortunately, oh, shit. <laughs> they, they failed absolutely miserably last night with this particular story. Uh, a couple months ago, uh, there was this woman named Cecilia Abadie, I believe, in Temecula, who caused an uproar last year for getting ticketed for Google glassing while driving. So I, remember, was, I remember when that happened. Yeah, yeah, so she was pulled over and got a ticket because obviously she's wearing Google glasses, which, you know, if you can't use your cell phone, you shouldn't be able to use those. Uh, <laughs> uh, she also was cited for speeding. So she was, yeah, she let's was also, put that in context. She was also <laughs> speeding, so she was already she didn't get pulled over just for wearing the glasses, but she got an additional fine for that. Yeah. Uh, woman bravely fights historic Google glassing while driving ticket, comma wins was the headline of the story bravely? itself. Bravely, and uh, t- they also titled it on their their FB link. Las titled, titled the story "Great News for Google Glass Fans." Now, this drives me insane. First off, this is useless page view journalism at its absolute worst. This is exactly the stuff that we rail about all the time on Huffington Post. It, it's a complete fucking non-story if you actually read it, which nobody on Facebook actually did because all the comments that were starting to go in under the thing just showed that nobody reads a goddamn thing. Uh, <laughs> first off, how is it great news for Google Glass fans? Because the lawsuit basically said, the judge stated that she won technically because the Google Glasses were off. If they had been on, it would have been a different story. So how's it a win for Google Glass fans? Because all it's really proven is that you can actually wear them as long as you're not using them. And <laughs> how can the cop tell if they're on or off well, from you know, yeah, that's, 50 feet away as he's, as he's gunning you with his radar? Exactly. You know? Or how can you even tell that she didn't just switch it off really quickly once she got pulled over? Exactly. So, can't, can't you just do a voice command, glass off? Yeah. You know? so, so the ruling basically just states that, uh, sure, you can have this useless piece of technology on you as long as you're not using it and it's not turned on. That's not a win for Google Glass fans. Secondly, I'm reasonably sure any cop, firefighter, regular person who has ever uh, – army peep guys, uh, anyone who's ever done anything brave would not find that <laughs> fighting a moving violation is brave. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> she, is, she is not brave. She was lawyered up and she went in there and whatever. There's nothing brave about that. And I'm annoyed at the judge as well for not, for not making any kind of – statement with this case he had the opportunity to basically just say no you cannot wear google glasses at all when you're driving which is we all know that's what's going to end up happening instead we're going to have to waste more taxpayer money there's going to be more cases that happen until we actually get to that point when he had the chance to basically just state you cannot wear these when operating a motor motor vehicle end of story done and he didn't do that which is which is what he should have done it's what he should have done i don't care if they're on or off they're on your face they're in they're in a vision obstruction I, no, get them off. Get the damn things off. Get the damn things off. Um, we're all agreed on that. It's just a fucking horrible story with horrible headlines and horrible writing. And fuck you for wasting my time. Well, you brought up LAS in the first place. I was going to say that from the get go, but hey. Well, the segment's called Are You Shitting Me? Welcome to this week in shit we put on our computers. So this week I saw uh, Warren Ellis, who is a comic writer and just general author and novelist, on Twitter mentioned an app called Kennedy that he was checking out. So yeah. I got a budget for apps that <laughs> I waste every week. And 
So I went and checked this out. This is kind of a a different type of journaling. It's literally just a one click save some data. Right. Off you go. You can right. save a note to it. You can put a photo with it. But it also gets like the news headline from what was going on at that moment. Gets your location. Here's the nice part about this one. Going back to your your shitty uh, uh, experience with moves. <laughs> You just you tie this to your Dropbox account, mm-hmm. saves all your data to a JSON file. Oh, that's very nice. I love. So you can do whatever you want to with it. I love companies that do that. Yep. So I don't know how useful it is. I've only had it for a couple of days, and it's been cold, and I haven't left this chair in a <laughs> while. Um, so once I once I start to leave again and move around, I don't know what kind of uses I'll have for it. But it's just kind of cool to be able to just go dink, you know, remember this spot, make a note, move right. on. Yeah. I think it'll be I think it'll be cool if like if I'm at a um if I'm out shopping or at a store or in a town I've never been, I can say like boom, cool Indian food here, you know, and then I'll have the GPS for it and I can go back later. Right. Like when I was in Asia, that would have been perfect. Just bouncing around Singapore and in Bangkok and Hong Kong. I could have just marked the places instead of having to, you know, just rely on backtracing stuff later. Just that one click save you know that's it's kind of what it is it's a one click save yeah so it's, it's an interesting concept i mean the the idea of of the context of the day is is kind of cool but kind of weird like i'm just looking at one of the screenshots and like it grabs a headline about iran warning ahead of nuclear talks i mean that i, I get it kind of provides a context for the day and the time and everything but what does that have to do with like this the picture of the guy in the coffee shop that captured this on a wet monday afternoon in new york oh well, i and, think it's and think iran's it's warning of a nuclear attack oh my god oh my god well i think <laughs> like five years from down the line right that'd be some that'd be some cool information yeah. you know what was going on in the world when you took this shot i yeah. think i like that i like that i mean i wish there was a setting for to turn it off because i really don't care All right um no, but still, I mean, it's just it's extra data. It doesn't right. really hurt anything. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like I said, it's a really interesting concept. And I, I talked a, a couple of weeks back about how I was rereading the kind of near fiction uh, books, the the first Immortal and uh, the Truth Machine. Um, and he wrote in a very sim- – he like this would be a perfect tool for him as he was writing those books, as he was like going around and grabbing headlines and things like that. So I could see this like definitely like if if you're a writer, if you're thinking about you know putting together some sort of like current events book and and you're putting it together over time all of these things would be really really useful to you i can't see myself personally using it but uh, i i can see the application and it's it's definitely interesting i'll give it that yeah that's what i thought so i'm giving it a shot i'll keep it around and see what see what's what and i do i have it on my home screen so it's there and it's in my in my you know mind space as it were uh, so when I go out and do something interesting, I'll probably just tap it and try it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Cause I all mean, it is, like I said, all it's doing is pumping a JSON file to my Dropbox. Yeah. Which is actually, I mean, much more useful than, than say social networking and things like that. Cause you know, you can, you can use Foursquare or, or Facebook and, and, you know, tag yourself at a restaurant that you really liked, but you're never going to go back and find it. This is something specific that you'd be able to troll through the data yourself really easily. So I like it for that. Yeah, that's all I want. And, and this is kind of – it's like a personal API kind of thing almost. Mm-hmm. So my next one is Launch Center Pro. Yes. Uh, this one costs 5 bucks. It's a – oh, you know what I should do? I should tell you exactly how much the other one costs too, shouldn't I? I believe it was 199 Is it 199 Yes, 199 for Kennedy. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, this one, uh, Launch Center Pro is 5 bucks, and what it does is it's almost like uh, – um, an Apple script for your iOS device. Okay. So you can, it's got like automations. So I can set up a one click text Brian right. button, you know, and it does a bunch of other stuff. It, it integrates with other apps on your phone. So you can do kind of like, you know, piping and things like that if you're into the Unix jargon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just neat stuff. So I haven't gotten super into it yet because there's a lot of apps that I don't really use on here yeah. that, that, that are built in. Um, but I'm starting to – at least just with the contact stuff, um, I've got like one-click text to everybody now, which that alone saves me a bunch of time. Right. Um, there's, just a, there's a bunch of neat stuff in there. Um, I don't know if it's worth trying out for five bucks. I will tell you next week what I think of it because I'll actually set everything up this week. Right. Um, or if you've, if you've actually used it 
and have any cool like formulas that your automations that you can send my way, send them to uh, Jason at grumpyoldgeeks.com. I'd love to really get deep into this thing. <laughs> um, but I, I, I would because it's like, you know, if I can save five clicks, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I, I personally don't. You, you are much more of a power user with your phone and your iOS devices than me. But uh, I, can, I can totally see how this would actually be useful for quite a few things, even for me. So I might have to check it out. Check it out, bro. Check it out. So for shit on we put on our computers, I actually don't have uh, any apps or anything. But I did stumble across um, a great site called BlueLounge.com, which basically is, sells gear uh cable management gear uh iOS you know power nap boxes um little little doohickeys basically to put all your stuff into and to manage the cables and make things look pretty they're very pretty devices i am i'm very impressed i'm going to be ordering quite a bunch of of things from from this site i have a feeling yeah this sanctuary for like cable management charger system looks awesome yeah i mean you you plug everything in it, it keeps it nice and clean on your desk it looks great um and you know everything's just charged and sitting right there and i'm looking at the sidoika i don't know exactly how to pronounce that, which is just a little dock that sits right next to your keyboard. I mean, if I had that, I'd be using it right now while we're doing the podcast. Ooh, that is kind of sexy. It's, right? it's not that bad. It's up to it's like twenty nine ninety five to forty nine ninety five. Yeah, and nothing on here is is incredibly expensive. It all is very well thought out. It all looks really nice. Um, if you've got if you've ever thought about cleaning up your your workspace and and just kind of everything else and having it look pretty sexy, this is a site to go to. Oh, I'm totally getting the Sudoika thing. Yeah, I'm this totally is this is nice. As well, so. Yeah, so it's it's super nice. Um, all this and it stuff. works. It works with your case on. Yeah, so you can put your your phone into the dock with the case on. Yeah, that's key. Exactly. Nice. And there's also the Nest iPod iPad stand, which is again exactly. If if it were sitting here right next to me right now, I would totally be using it while we're doing this podcast instead of holding up my iPad Mini every couple seconds to check our Google Drive. <laughs> Ooh, that's cute. It's just a little bucket, yeah. actually. It's oh, just a little bucket that has cute. a little a pull-out stand, so you can stand it multiple directions. It's fourteen ninety-five, and it comes in a variety of colors, and you can stick your keys in there. And it's, this stuff is well thought out. It's really this is cool. really cool. I'm glad you found this site. Yeah, yeah I'm definitely going to be ordering quite a few of these things. So, oh. it's well, worth checking it, it's out. It's not people. shit we put on our computers; it's shit we put our computers on. Exactly. <laughs> I'll just cut up Bob's intro and redo it. You know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> A friend of mine, Matt Quinn, who uh, lives in Toronto, kind of does uh, basically what we do. Uh, he's a super tech guy, has his own design company, wrote an article on Medium a couple weeks ago that uh, I read through and I thought was really interesting. It's why I dropped ebooks and embraced a and embraced a perfect technology in its original and most meaningful meaningful form, meaning he went back to actual printed Dead cover, trees. Dead tree <laughs> books. Uh, it's a good read. It makes you think about it. I don't entirely agree with him, um, but I thought it was really interesting, so I wanted to throw it in the show notes and, and have people take a look at it. It's a different way of thinking. Well, it's a way of kind of rediscovering and rethinking about all the uh, e-books and all the e-reading that we've been doing. Okay, so I, I, I read the article. Mm-hmm. I just got a few things to say about it. Sure. Um, his His – his premise is valid. Yeah. He was having problems, technical problems with his ebooks, mm-hmm. which started him down the path of going back to real books. I've never had an ebook problem, period. Uh, neither have I've I. Never had, I've never had anything fail to sync. I've never had anything that it was illegible or a font size wrong. If it is, it's usually PebCAC. <laughs> problem exists between keyboard and chair, as they say. Um, and the funny thing is, in his, uh, on, his, on his Medium, which we should have him on to say, why the fuck are you publishing on Medium? Um, <laughs> Uh, he his he's got a lot of books that are upside down, like uh, Lord of the Rings by Tolkien, <laughs> the far right. Um, so I don't know, maybe you know there, but uh, no, I'm just joking. No. I, li- I like the article. I thought it was a well thought out article. And there are times when I will take a hardcover book and or not hardcover, just a physical book and go read it. Yeah, you know, it's nice. It's a nice change of pace. It is a nice change of pace. Yeah. For yeah. the most part, though, after breaking my back for 20 years schlepping. <laughs> thousands of pounds of books around the country. Guess what? My air better than dead tree. That's all I got to say. I, uh, I'm with you a hundred percent. Um, I liked his article. I liked his thinking. Uh, I don't agree. So, 
but it's worth it's worth a read. And uh, you know, he thought it is. Out. It, it's a nice counterpoint. I didn't know he was your buddy, so I didn't know there was nepotism going on with this one. But yeah. it was still. I read it. It was a good article. I think. It, I think for a lot of people, it's some people may get something out of it and go buy a book. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? So I. Did read a book this week, which I want to talk about really briefly as well. I did not read it uh, in a physical form. It was an ebook read, which uh, was quite comfortable for me. The Examined Life How We Lose and Find Ourselves by Stephen Gross. Um, not my typical nonfiction that I would read. This is a, a psychoanalyst who is a bit on in years and has written a couple books. And it's a really, I, I, I enjoyed this read a lot. If you're interested in the human condition and delving into how vastly different people can be and how they can just have completely different approaches and mindsets and the various uh, life events and things that happen to us that make us into the people that we are, you will enjoy this. It is not scientific at all. He does not delve into the you know nitty gritty of psychoanalysis or any kind of theories. He just simply, each chapter kind of recounts an experience that he had with the patient, usually through one particular story. And he uses it to illustrate different different issues that we all deal with. Um, it was a great read. Really enjoyed it. Okay. I, w- I would uh, ask if I could borrow it from you, but you got it. But uh, it's an Amazon book. I'm guessing you got for uh, yeah. Kindle. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Lending is not enabled on this book. Yes. That's one of the things it's like once I got my prime account and that I could do the borrowing and lending, <laughs> I've been so psyched. I've been lending books out hand over fist, but this one doesn't have it enabled. So I can't borrow it. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, it's, you know, it's a, it's a good read. If you're, if you're, it's, it's simple. It's, it's, you know, one or two chapters, uh, at night before I went to sleep, you can, you can run through them really quick. Some of them are really insightful and amazing. And some of them will speak to you and your personal issues, or some of them will speak to, won't speak to you at all, but it's still intriguing. And I really enjoy enjoyed the way he approached it and wrote it. Okay, cool. I've got a couple this week. Uh, I have McMafia, A Journey Through the Global Criminal Underworld by Misha Glennie. This is book's a couple years old, but it talks about the rise of the criminal underground after the fall of the Soviet Union. Right. It's very detailed. Um, and honestly, I couldn't read it. I got, I got a third <laughs> of the way through and because I had it on Audible – and I was trying to listen to it, trying to get into it. Uh, maybe if I had the paper copy, but the paper copy sells for like fifty bucks because this is like a, it's a tome. It's a it's a it's a, it's a major book. Uh, it's like a fourteen hour re- listen if you have that. Right. Um, but it it didn't really the narrative didn't really grab me as far as I mean it's a, it's a true story. That's the problem. It's like you couldn't embellish. It's a and it's a fascinating true story, but I just didn't have any context for it, and I just don't really care about gangsters in russia right now (laughs) yeah yeah i thought i would i mean i thought that was like kind of my wheelhouse i thought i'd be into it but i just could not get into it i mean if you're into that kind of thing go for it it's a classic i mean people talk about it all the time i just it wasn't for me this time maybe i'll go back to it in the future or since i got it on audible i'll trade it in for another book all Um, right there you go my other auto I i got a couple real quick audible ones um the BBC did a re-recording or, or an audio play of Neverwhere, mm-hmm. uh, I think on BBC Four, and they finally released it on Audible. Right. It's really good. I it's if you've never seen the television series Neverwhere, it's it's amazing. It's better than that is. But if you've seen the television series, don't waste your time. Okay. Honestly, don't waste your time because it is almost verbatim somebody reading the the teleplay from the the show. Okay. That was the real bummer for me. Um, and it was only like four and a half, five hours. So it's abridged. It's not the full book. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a better version of Neverwhere on Audible that you can get that's read by, you know, a cast. And I, I just want to jump in really quickly because I know, you know, there's a, there's a lot of Neil Gaiman love coming from the other microphone and has come out on this podcast a lot. I personally am not a huge Neil Gaiman fan, but Neverwhere was a fantastic book. So if you haven't read it yet and you're on the fence about Gaiman like, like I am, that's a good one. Yeah, this and Good Omens are, are my two favorite books that he's written. Yeah, agreed. Like we had Tim Ferriss on. He talked about the Graveyard book, which honestly was the Jungle book. So with murderers and ghosts, um, I, I liked it. I wasn't a huge fan of it. I thought it was kind of eh. his new one, The Ocean at the End of the Lane. Eh. <laughs> I don't think I don't think he's had a real hit since Neverwhere. Personally, right. Stardust was okay. The movie for Stardust was great, but I'm going to stop talking about Neil Gaiman now. <laughs> now I'm going to talk about Charlie Strauss. Okay, he's a science fiction writer. I think he's in Scotland. 
Um, huh. Scotland or England. Hanging out with the Butterfly guys? Uh, no, I think he's on the other side. Um, but he, he's he got this series called The Laundry Files, which I just picked up on Audible because they recommended it. And I had a bunch of extra credits. And it's 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 really good middle of the road sci fi. It's uh, uh it's hard to explain. It's it kind of um integrates computer science with Lovecraftian uh <laughs> uh space monsters and ancients. It's right. really weird, but it's fun. It, I, I dig them. They, I mean it's a solid four across the board. Okay. And I just I just read the last two, uh the Apocalypse Codex and the Fuller Memorandum. They were good. They were really good. So I think that's four books that are out now for the Laundry Files okay. uh, series. He's, he's working on another one. And you should follow him on Twitter. He's really funny on Twitter. <laughs> I find some good stuff from him. So that's pretty much it for me for the week. I'm still working through Zorba the Greek, uh, actually reading it, not listening to it. So right. it takes a little longer that way because I'm slow. <laughs> and I'm actually looking for another kind of sci-fi book right now. So if anybody out there has got a good suggestion, uh, drop it, uh, drop it to us. Cool. Yeah, and I'm I'm actually going to return uh, the Morrissey autobiography to Audible. I can't listen to it. I, I wouldn't. I, can't. I wouldn't listen to it either. I would read it. Yeah, I might have to. Well, <laughs> hop on. Oh, oh, that's yes. right. You could. You didn't buy it. I didn't actually <laughs> so. buy this one, so I could send it to you. Assuming all you have to do. No, is, no, is no, make, no, 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 no. If buy, buy us. Buy a Morrissey or Smith's album. I, I have bought them all. I was just, I was just, if you if it was on Kindle, then you could loan it to me. But it, I'll just go, I'll buy it and pick it up. I, I think I believe it is out now in the U.S. Uh, it, it is, yeah. So, yeah. so that's how I got it on Audible. It came out on the same day, uh, I think December third, okay. December third or seventh. Right. It came out on all formats in the U.S., so it is out. But I can't listen to it, man. The language is just so fucking flowery. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> oh, I mean, it's worse than Charles Dickens. <laughs> Ew, candy, 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 candy. I've talked about a couple books on at the library, the uh, You Are Not So Smart uh, book and the You Are Now Less Dumb book by <laughs> David McCraney. Mm -hmm. He's got a podcast. I didn't know this. <laughs> I follow uh, Mark Frauenfelder on Twitter and he – said that he was listening to the new episode and I'm like what? So yesterday or last night I picked him up and started from the beginning. Fantastic podcast. It's it's basically a scientific look at self-delusion and the things that we do to fool ourselves into getting through the day. Very nice. I mean and very similar to the book I talked about as well. So. That's what yeah. I didn't want to bring it up because <laughs> you got you got to check out this podcast because there are some that com that just go straight at that. Right. Um, it it is it's constantly, it's, it's constantly it's really amazing the the things and the tricks that our brain will will do to us to uh, get us through a day. <laughs> yeah, the fact that we're blind two to three hours a day because whenever your eyes do a saccade, you 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 can't see. Right. You know, just little things like that are just like, wow, that's kind of creepy. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's just a lot of it. There's a. It, I'm, I'm only four episodes in. But I was like binge listening last night and this morning. It is amazing. Definitely check it out. Uh, and I, I want to throw a shout out to our boy Kenny in London. <laughs> uh, I talked last week that there was never going to be a Dirk Gently series. Apparently there was one two years ago and I missed it. So <laughs> it's free on Amazon. If you have Amazon Prime, you can watch it for free. I've got it queued up. Um, and all I can say is I really hope it doesn't suck. But the fact that I've never heard about it. The fact it that now you haven't heard about it and I haven't heard scary. about it. Yes, yes. Because I was a huge fan of the book as well. And not hearing about it means it's probably not any good. I watched the first 10 minutes. It seemed okay. The guy that plays Dirk is probably not my first choice. But let's see if he grows on me. Okay. And lastly, Zane Lamprey's back with the Zane Lamprey show. On the same thread that he has had multiple iterations of different shows. He just never <laughs> changes his RSS feed like his underwear. I was about uh, to say, isn't this like the fifth or sixth different podcast he's had out now? I, th it's funny thing is we both love Zane Lamprey, but all we're doing on our podcast is crapping on him because everything he's doing is so stupid right now. <laughs> well, and it pissed me off with the, the cheap shirts after saying for months that quality is the number one concern. Right. 
whatever. It doesn't matter. He, he talks about Chug a little bit on the first episode. It, it is now the reboot episode that's up now. All right. Link in the show notes. Um, his his buddy Dane Dunn who right. was on the show before. He, he's off doing his actual career, uh, writing television. So he left. Okay. Um, and 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 if you do want to go back, like a couple episodes back, there's a great episode with Zoe Bell, the uh, the stunt woman. Okay. She lives in Venice. You might be able to run into her. Oh, Although, okay. I'll check it out. I'll kick your ass. Um, it's, it's it's actually really good. I mean, you've seen Death Proof, right? The Quentin Tarantino movie. Yes. Yeah, she was the star of that. She's uh, an amazing stunt woman and and really funny. I mean, she's really funny. That was the best part about it. She was totally jived with them. Well worth a listen. Cool. Very cool. Yeah, I, I mean, I do like Zane. I think he's a really funny guy. And I, I I lost interest in his podcast for a while because they kept changing. And I wasn't a big fan of the co-host that he had last time. And uh, I'll give it a listen again. What the hell? Yeah, I mean, he it was surprising because he did the – he has the Guinness Book – or Guinness Book of World Records for longest podcast. They did they podcasted <laughs> for like 25 hours straight. Right. And then the next episode was, eh, we're not doing it anymore. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> Okay, yeah. and they brought in the new guy, and I didn't really like the new guy. Yeah, was, but the new guy was pretty funny on the Zoe Bell episode. So cool. But now he's gone, so you can go back to, and it's the old cast is back, and it's like they never left. Closing shout out. I want to give a big shout out to Wyoming. You finally made it onto our list. Yes, we now have all fifty states. <laughs> Woo-hoo! So whoever you are that listened in Wyoming, uh, drop us a line. We want to say hi. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Finally. Although they probably listened once and will never listen again. So um, <laughs> the next person to listen to Wyoming. Yes. <laughs> send us your cords. Um, so uh, our buddy David Teeter was going to be on this week to talk about security stuff, but he has the flu. So we skip security this week and we will be back next week with a, an expanded security segment with his expert analysis because we want to talk about the Snowden stuff. Because yes. when when he first came on was right when the Snowden docs came out, and we had an interesting conversation about it. But now that so much more has come out, I'd like to just have him on to get a get a new fresh take from somebody that was inside the machinery. Cool. And I think maybe he got sick because he was in San Francisco and had a three dollar slice of toast. <laughs> um, we were going to do a bit on this artisanal toast craze, quote on my air quotes and eye rolling going on there. Yeah. Um, I'll put the link in the show notes. You can. You can go look at it if you want. Um, it's on psmag.com, but you know what? I don't know. You don't even need to give them. I found this in, in my dig email in one morning, <laughs> and literally the headline was Blame San Francisco. Yeah, <laughs> so. well, it, it, it would not be out of place if this were a Venice Beach story instead of San Francisco. So, <laughs> Yeah, whatever. Artisanal fucking toast. Give me a break. Exactly. So I got to – Take a – I got to breathe in for this one. I almost have to hyperventilate. Okay. Um, last night or two nights ago, I made a post on Facebook that was just kind of when I reached the breaking point with WordPress. I was I was done. I am never touching it again unless I have to. Which you do. Um, um, well, no. I mean it's optional in many cases and I'm, I'm looking at new platforms. But here's the, here's the crux of what happened. I get a call. I'm ready to go to bed. Had a couple cocktails. I'm sleepy, getting ready to listen to my Budify. And then I get a call saying, we've been hacked. I'm like, what? (laughs) And I go to the site and there's that Google malware warning flashing red saying, don't go, don't go, don't go. And I'm like, what the hell? And go through and check it out. And sure enough, some douchebag broke into our WordPress site and is injecting malware. Right? Yep. Had it happen to me many times. Happens to yeah. every. If you run WordPress long enough, it's going to happen to you. Here's here's the difference. This was on a fully patched, upgraded system with no uh, no old plugins, no old source, nothing. It I had run it through the security scanners. Everything was locked down, and they still got in. <laughs> oh boy! Yeah. That's a fun way to, to end your day to figure out how those little bastards got in. <laughs> so I'm just like, I'm done. I'm done. They have, they've got children running the show over there. And it's not even the WordPress guys so much, but it, in, in a sense it is, but it's the plugin vendors that are just they're, – they're, the, you know, they're the hole. They yeah. are the fucking hole because they don't know how to write code. I mean, they, yeah, they can figure out how to type hello world and get a little bit of shit in, but for the most part – these people are not computer scientists. They're not security experts. 
they're just they're getting by with the basics to get done what needs to get done. It's, this is the downside of open source. Not even so much open source. This is what happens when something gets too big. Right. <laughs> Hang on one second. I had to take a sip of water for that one. Um, in the in the natural world, we have what's called biodiversity. The more biodiverse an ecosystem, the healthier it is. When you start to get systems that let, – let's, let's look at West Virginia and inbreeding. <laughs> um, no offense to our West Virginia <laughs> listeners. Um, it breaks down the biodiversity and then it's open to attack. Right now, WordPress runs 20% of the internet. Yeah. That is not a lot of biodiversity there. Nope. Uh, so it's uh, – I mean, I, I can scream for an hour on this, but all I'm saying is find something new. There are new platforms out there every day and simplify. Don't, you don't need flying out sidebars, all this crazy shit. It's just driving me insane. I'm going to put a post up on my blog about this, which is now going to be hosted not on WordPress. Um, <laughs> I'm going to try Ghost. Everybody's talking about Ghost. It's a Node.js backend, whatever the little hipster fixie kids are playing with nowadays. Um but I'm probably going to end up for my blog just going back to fucking text files that are spit out of a database on a back end that I wrote. Right. You know? It's really not that hard to write a blog engine. No. It's, Ob- well, obviously. <laughs> to, to be honest, it's really not that hard to code a site. It costs a little bit of money. Um, and, you know, I've, I've been doing artist sites for 15 years now. Um, any site that I've built myself has never been hacked. Every single artist website that I've been forced to develop on WordPress has been hacked. Yeah. End, of, end of story. <laughs> exactly. And here's, the, here's the, the problem that people don't understand when they say, I want to use WordPress. They're like, WordPress is free. It's no, not free. It is not fucking free. You're going to spend more money with WordPress experts, plugins, uh, you know, paid plugins, maintenance, security updates, backups, restorations, fixes after a hack, all this bullshit – just get a custom little website with a little admin panel that you can just write your shit in. Boom. You're done. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, and the other thing that drives me insane too is is a lot of these people actually think that they're going to do their updates themselves and half the time they don't. So I've been forced to use a platform that I told them is – insecure and is crap anyways for a reason that they'll never end up doing. I end up going into WordPress and typing in the updates because they just don't do it. Exactly. It, this, this whole thing makes no sense. I mean – Oh, I'm 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 seriously just I'm going to start putting out code for the stuff that I do and I'm putting it out in pieces so people can piecemeal their own systems together because what you don't want is homogeny. You want diversity. Yes. You know? And we've just gotten away from that because people are just fucking lazy <laughs> and stupid. So, that's what I mean, I, you know, I had a much <laughs> My rant was basically Matt Mullenweg and I first got to San Francisco on the same rainy night way back in 90 or 2000 something. I can't remember. We were going to our friend's party. I feel like I met Hitler that night and if I had just shot Hitler, World War II would have never started. We would not be in this boat right now if I had just put Mullenweg back on a train, sent his ass back to Texas and said, get the fuck out of my town. <laughs> but I didn't. Um <laughs> Because wow. all the girls said he's cuter than you and you need to play nice or we're not going to talk to you. Uh, well, you know what? They still don't talk to me anymore, so fuck him. I should have put his ass on the train. Wow. Somebody needs some honey. Oh, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so you saw my tweet about the honey too, I guess. I did, yes. <laughs> yes. So uh, in, in an effort to get to sleep better uh, two nights ago, I was – I had the hiccups, but I needed to have my honey before I went to bed so I could sleep better. Well – Hiccuping and swallowing honey took about uh, you know half a teaspoon down my lungs, and I <laughs> coughed for nine hours trying to get the shit out, and had just uh, these horrible red eyes, these tears running down my face. Didn't sleep. It was terrible. It was very ironic, I think. Yeah, very ironic. <laughs> well, I've I've personally found that the honey has actually had no effect on me. I, I still do it just because I do it, but I haven't really noticed much of anything. But to get back to the point, yes, uh, WordPress is not good. It's it's good for what it is. The problem is the fact that everybody uses it. The problem is it's become this thing that people who don't really understand websites just assume that WordPress is the way to go. Um, I wouldn't say that you would had to kick him back to Texas or go back in time and have shot him and it would save the world from anything because if if it, if not WordPress, then Drupal. 
Uh, I think Drupal's <laughs> bad enough that everybody knows better. WordPress <laughs> at least had a good design. Um, yeah, no, I couldn't have fixed the world. And uh, by the way, there, there are tricks with the honey that you have to not have carbs for four hours before you go to bed. Right. If you don't have you, – so you drink stuff. So <laughs> that kind of negates the, the, the honey thing. Anyway, yeah, I'm going to be putting together a, a solid plan for all my clients that are running on WordPress to get the fuck off of WordPress because – they're paying me more money to fix it when it gets broken than they are if they would have just paid me to to custom code something. Right. Honestly, no, I I agree completely. The thing is that you know most people would just run with that because that's a business model. Um, I will keep fixing your WordPress that will keep getting hacked and will keep breaking. Uh, there are a know, lot of people out there that make a lot of money are, on that. Yeah, model. that that is a business model, and you and yeah. I are not those people. I'm the one, and and you as well. That you know, I sit there screaming, just saying, "Please God, no WordPress." At mm-hmm. the very beginning of a project, and I try to explain why, and, and they just don't listen. So, I, I, you know, you will save money in the long run if you do not do WordPress. Oh, tons of money. Yeah. Unless you are an independent person who can sit there by themselves and don't really care if you get hacked. But the, the clients I'm working with are, you know, these are $100 million companies yeah. that I'm doing WordPress sites for. And the, the CEO is the one that's, <laughs> like, pissed off at me. Right. That's not something that I uh, that's not a position I want to be in as a vendor that that I am at fault for something that I could have avoided if I'd have just explained to them in the beginning but they're like you broke our site and I'm like no no you wanted <laughs> wordpress let me explain this to you in very small words yeah um so <laughs> no i mean if you're a 100 million dollar company you have no business having a wordpress site anyways build something from scratch Build something from scratch or <laughs> the other site they have is Expression Engine, so which is just as bad but not as bad because it doesn't get hacked as much because nobody uses it because it's a giant piece of shit too. <sighs> okay. there, I, feel, I feel better. So, I feel a lot better. Well, I'm glad you feel better. So next week. <laughs> <laughs> next week we'll have Dr. Teeter on and he can tell, tell me how big of an idiot I am. But uh, Excellent. Until then – Please, if you're a listener, go to iTunes and give us a rating and a star, please, pretty please, preferably more than one. We uh, and tell a friend. That's pretty tell much our friend. only. That's our only uh, outlet for uh, keeping this thing going. So, if you like to hear me scream about uh, WordPress and you like to hear Brian scream about crowdfunding, then uh, <laughs> give us a hand and give us a star. Seriously, we appreciate it. We really do. Thank you. And drop it. Drop us an email at uh, podcast at grumpyoldgeeks.com or hit us up on tugyards.com. And uh, yeah. cool. Hope to talk to you next week. Talk to you next week. Keep up with the Grumpy Old Geeks on the web at GrumpyOldGeeks.com, on Facebook at Facebook.com slash GrumpyOldGeeks, or email them at podcast at GrumpyOldGeeks.com. Have a good week. Okay, last one to kill a bad guy buys the beer. We're driving to Florida.